Now, he was very entrepreneurial because he said the factories were open Monday through Saturday. They worked six days a week, but they didn't work Sunday. So they didn't get much use of the trolleys on Sunday. So what he did was he owned land down on um, Maple Street, off of Maple Street, called Chestnut Hill, which he eventually gave to, uh, end up giving to the city. But he built a, a park down there. So on Sundays, the people had to take the trolley, would take the trolley down there because he had the cap on down there too. And they'd take it down there and they'd have, you know, they have concerts and other things going on there at the park. And uh, so he was very entrepreneurial. Now he, now he had more work for his trolley, trolleys instead of them sitting around on Sunday not doing much of anything. So as I say, he was a real entrepreneurial spirit and, and really came up with a lot of different ways to make money and make the city better. He was always thinking of making the city better, not just himself. I mean, he knew that by doing a lot of these things, by, by you know, bringing in the, uh, the railroad and the, the gas company, a lot of these helped his business, but he also helped all the other people along the way. So he, he understood that. Besides that, he owned a coal business. He owned a machine shop, a rather large machine shop. He was the largest holder of real estate in town. He uh, built, sold, leased houses, sold land, took back mortgages. A lot of the, the other shoemakers, the later years like uh, Howe and Fry, a lot of the houses you see in Marble were built by these people, by Boyd and Corey, by S.H. Howe, uh, by John Fry, Charles O'Connell, a lot of them built houses. They built them for their workers. As I was telling you, they built the bigger ones for their uh, a lot of the houses that you see down on Newton Street, Park Street, that Fairmont, that whole area, it's a real nice houses. They're built by Sam Boyd. Uh, and uh, they were for foremen or merchants, uh, you know, doctors, uh, wealthy people of the time uh, lived in those big houses. So uh, he did an awful lot of real estate in the city and helping build, in the, build the, the town up. As I said, he donated a lot of land to town, but most notably was Chestnut Hill which was um, a large land hold, and I think it was about 40 acres or 50 acres, that he, uh, which would be all that land, a lot of it's developed now, but up behind the old Marble Enterprise, there's a hill that goes up like that, that's what's called Chestnut Hill. Uh, and uh, he owned that, that whole section there. Besides where he built his house, which I'm gonna show you coming up pretty soon here, um, on Fairmont Hill, he owned tons of land in that whole area up there. He had bought an estate, uh, of someone, I can't remember his name, but that, that owned a lot of old derelict houses that he ended up ripping down and rebuilding houses there and, uh, and a lot of land. So, um, so he did build up an awful lot of the, of the city. He was very involved civically. Uh, he was the very first president and one of the founders of the Marble Savings Bank. And uh, he was also president director of the First National Bank. Uh, he was chairman of the Marble Philharmonic Society. He loved music. And uh, that's how he got to know that F.W. Riley. I was talking, telling you about that bought the old skating rink off of him and turned it into a theater. Hated politics. Absolutely hated politics, but got talked into running for selectman and he, after one term he says, I've had enough, that's it. <laughs> so he was a one-term selectman. Uh, same thing with the Massachusetts General Court. They kept after him and after him and after him, and he finally said, okay. And he only served one term there, too. But he just was, he says, I can better serve my community other places than in politics, you know. And, uh, but he was civ civically involved. He was very charitable. He gave the, the land and construction of the French Protestant Church. Now, a lot of you might say, what? Where is that? Where the heck is that? There it is right there. We know it today as the Italian church, which is closed up on Lincoln Street. But that was there before the Italian church. He gave them $1,000 to buy the land there, and then he gave them $600 towards building the structure. Uh, it doesn't sound like a lot of money, but you've got to remember, <laughs> back then it was a lot of money. So he also gave $400 for the land for the Holy Trinity Church. Does anybody know where that? I know Susan does. You, I don't want you answering Susan. <laughs> where the Dunkin' Donuts is today. Yeah, Judy knows. It's where the Dunkin' Donuts is today. This was what 
was where Dunkin' Donuts is today. That church there, all covered in ivy. It was a beautiful church. That's a postcard right here, but I remember this. I used to walk home by this, and Judy probably did too, on our way home from school. And it was such a beautiful church. It was, it's Walter, I'm sure you remember it too, walking by that. It was gorgeous. And uh, so this is where Dunkin' Donuts is today. This is where uh, Conley's law office is over here. The old KSC building would be right there. But he, he bought the land for them to build that. Um, he also, we used to have a YMCA in Marvel, believe it or not, back then in the 1800s, Young Men's Christian Association. Uh, and he was very religious, which you'll find out later on here. But, uh, so he donated money to them over the, over the various years. Same thing with his church. As a member of the First Church, he was a very generous financial supporter. He gave money to every Marble Civil War soldier that had a family. He'd be down there and they were getting ready to leave and he'd put money in each one of them's hands. Every one of them that was going off to fight so that they, their family would have money while they were away fighting. He gave money and that, there was, let me tell you, Paul, how many people fought for Marble in the Civil War? Quite a few, hundreds of them, hundreds of them fought in the Civil War. So uh, there was quite a few. His pastor, pastor stated after he passed away that he gave more than anyone knew. In uh, the memorial service they had for him afterwards, uh, they told a story of this stranger that came to town. There was a businessman, but he moved to town. He knew no one. No one knew him, but he had, wanted to start a business, and he went to Sam Boyd. He said, I know you don't know me, but I got this idea, I want to do this. And Sam Boyd lent him the money to get going. And he became very successful because of that. So he was like that. You know, he, 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 if he could find, see someone that was a young man with a good idea. Because that's the way, when he started business, he had no money. He had his hands, he had the trade he learned, and that was it. But they, they had no money. They were fortunate they had their parents' house to work out of. But that was it, and the idea of, of making it mass-produced shoes. So uh, he had that. Joan found a uh, picture of an $18.90 bill. By the way, 92. 92, I'm sorry. Joan Abshire, one of our members here, has helped me put together the PowerPoint presentation. And a lot of this comes from her. I, I want to make sure she gets a lot of credit for that because it's been a lot of work, especially putting up with me. That's for sure. So. Yeah. Uh, this is the first church where he was a member, uh, which is right at the top of uh, Bolton Street above the Commons. A lot different than today because this came down in the hurricane of 1938, and it's more like right here now, you know. So it's a big difference. But for some of you that didn't know, taking a look at it, uh, you might say, where the heck was that? But that's the first church. Um, personal. He was married in 1845 to his first wife, Anne F. Brigham. Anne died in 1881. Uh, he went on to marry his second wife, Mary Lizzie Lawrence of Shrewsbury, shortly thereafter. Back then, it was not uncommon to marry within three months, six months, or whatever. Sometimes it was not uncommon to marry your sister-in-law <laughs> or someone like that. So. He, uh, you know, it was shortly thereafter. They don't, they, all they said in the history stuff is shortly thereafter. She died before he died in 1889. Four daughters were listed in his obituary. Uh, Mrs. Samuel Dowland of Somerville, Mrs. Henry Aldrich of Boston, and he had two that they, never, they ended up never marrying, Florence and Lydia, Lydia of Marble. He lived in a stately Italianate mansion on Fairmont Hill, on the crest of Fairmont Hill. This is the crest of Fairmont Hill. This is the summit, the top right here. This is Fairmont Street coming up like that. Newton Street's down here. This is the Liberty Street over here, or Rheingold here. He had a 20-acre parcel, and that was his house and barn right there. And this is what it looked like right there. It was a magnificent mansion where he held balls and social events all the time. And... Uh, you know, it's one of the biggest sins we have in Marble. Thomas Corey's mansion's another one. 
and a lot of others that are long gone. Uh, Ella Biggles house that was on the corner of Pleasant and Lincoln Street, that's now a Shell gas station. It was a mansion, they had a ballroom on the top floor, it was so big. But I'll be prepared for this next picture because this is what it looked like in 1973. Nineteen seventy three, that's what it looked like. It had been made into like a four or five family. And uh there were you could see it's so dilapidated, it's unbelievable. Here's some other interior pictures uh of it. You can see the nice staircase, so you see the circular staircase here. Look at the back. Look at the back of it here. You know. Uh it's just a shame. But I'm gonna read to you an excerpt from a, a woman who lived there. In, in 1913, it won't take that long, but she describes the house, the interior of the house, it's quite interesting. Uh, she lived there on and off for 30 years. The lower part of the house was red-faced brick and the top white with a metal roof. A circular tar driveway to the mansion <clears throat> had a border of tall pine trees and in the center of the lawn, a huge silver maple tree with five limbs and a circle at the base. With a board between the limbs, it made a fine place to sit and read on a sunny summer day, as I often did. An iron hitching post and eight granite steps led to the entrance porch with square pillars. Um, when I go back to the good picture, you can see the uh, what she's talking about, this, the front stairs right here, down in here. Uh, uh, with square pillars. The front door was massive with panels of frosted flowered glass and a fan-shaped glass over the door. Uh, unfortunately, it's kind of shaded so you can't see that. The foyer was very impressive with a fireplace and a circular mahogany staircase going up two flights of stairs and had six foot high niches for statues at intervals. To the right of the foyer was the formal parlor, a long room with a beautiful white marble fireplace carved with grapes over the firebox and a very large Rocco gold leaf mirror reaching to the 12 foot high ceilings. To the left was a library with stained glass doors, another fireplace and glass shelves for books, a large conservatory for plants and flowers adjoining the library. The smaller reception room had an outside balcony facing the street. The dining room was entered from the foyer and had a parquet floor and was large enough to serve 20 people. The fireplace with German tiles around it was made in Chelsea by the law company and presented the four seasons. The walls and ceiling were dark green plaster with gold leaf circles. A huge kitchen with the usual black stove set in the wall had many ovens and about eight lids. It extended across one end of the room. From the foyer on the right side was a powder room for gentlemen only then a long conservatory for plants leading to a billiard room. It was large enough for, four pool for a pool table and perhaps four card tables. On the second floor were five big bedrooms with walk-in closets and a dressing room. The windows in most of the house touched the floor and had inside shutters. A full bathroom and a half one were on this floor and two small rooms in the back, possibly for household help with a stairway directly to the kitchen. I'm sure it was the uh, kitchen help. The third floor had one room we called the boat room. It had round windows in each direction. The rest of the space was used by two attics. More stairs led to the top of the house. This had 16 windows and a view in every direction for miles. Now back then you could see this house for miles. Miles and miles around because not like today, everything built up and so forth, but you could see this house uh, all, from all, all angles. The large two-storied barn, which was in the back here, which you can see is the Italian, such as the same construction as here, um, was beautifully lined with oiled match boards, had rooms for the coachman and outside help upstairs. Huge chests built into the walls for harnesses and equipment of the fancy horses owned by Mr. Boyd. The 20 acres that belonged to the estate had tar walks with garden flowers and many apple, pear, and cherry trees. Located on one of the seven hills of marble, 
It was always a breeze and a wonderful view. Sam Boyd built this house for his family and lived there until his death in 1892. He must have had many happy days there, enjoyed his mansion as we did too. You can see what a beautiful house that had, had to have been, only for it to fall upon something like that. Today, this is what's there, condominiums. If you go up Fairmont Hill and the house on the left and you see number 64, look to your right and you'll see the condominiums. There's one, two, three, three sets of buildings. And this is where his house was, right in here. That's what's there today. So, another sin of the city of Marble, as I say. Marble mourns. On September 19, 1892, his obituary in the Marble Enterprise stated, he died on September 19, 1892. His obituary in the Marble Enterprise the next day stated, that he expired at 5.30 p.m. just as the whistle on his factory blew for the close of the day's work. <laughs> That's something. He was waked at his home. Uh, it was like one, one night wake. It was mainly for family and close friends. Uh, his funeral was held on the afternoon of September 22nd. I want you to think of anybody else in Marble that had a funeral like this man had. Let me read off. All the stores were closed. The schools held just a morning session because the funeral was in the afternoon. All banks suspended business. City highway employees did not work. The Boyd and Corey factory closed for the day. In fact, there was a general suspension of business all in the whole town, the whole city of Marble. Uh, so you can see what an impact he had. And there's more. On that day, there was only a simple service held in his home. They felt that there would be too many people that would want to attend, so they said, we'll hold a memorial service later on. So they just had a simple service. And at the close of the service, approximately 200 workmen from his factory and the street railway marched two abreast into the home to view uh, Mr. Boyd's body, followed by about 75 ladies from the factory to take a farewell walk, too. Some of the pallbearers that day was the mayor of the city at the time, George A. Howe, city treasurer C.F. Holyoke, the head cashier at the Marble Savings Bank, E.R. Alley, uh, and the head cashier of the First National Bank, F.L. Claflin. Alley had worked, both these men had worked for, for Mr. Boyd at one time. Uh, I believe Mr. Holyoke did too. A lot of people worked for Boyd and Corey, so they're all, all, all together. Employees in a long line of carriages follow the remains to Chipman Cemetery on Stephen Street. I'll show you where that is in a, in a few minutes here, but it was estimated that, uh, uh, let me get to that after. Uh, I didn't put it in here, but the streets from Main and Florence Street, Main and uh, Fairmont Street, all the ways down Main to East Main, all the ways up East Main and up Stevens, was lined, <coughs> lined with people lined with people to follow the procession. They had the, um, of course back then, there was no John Rowe, <laughs> you know, and an auto, automotive hearse and everything. It was a glass enclosed hearse with the horses drawn and all the other carriages with the family and everybody followed, all the employees that these ones I talked about here were following behind. And, uh, and then they walked by and all the school children were out and, Everybody was out because everything was closed and they all came down to, to bid their, say their final farewell. Uh, it was estimated that at the grave site at the uh, Chipman Cemetery on, on Stephen Street, which is next to Rocklawn Cemetery, Rocklawn is the newer part of it. Chipman, uh, I see someone right here that I know his parents are, uh, are buried in Rocklawn. And uh, as a matter of fact, I met him there one day. And, uh, this is his uh, grave site, right? This whole thing right here is uh, where his grave site. So 1,000 people, you've got to remember too, there was not much probably around there at the time, but 1,000 people uh, circled around the grave site to bid him farewell and to give you a, a closer view of, this is his uh, Samuel Boyd and his two wives right here. And out front here is children 
and uh, the two uh, daughters that married their husbands uh, and their children are, are out here too, or along here. That alley I was t talking about, he's buried behind him back here. And um, a lot of uh, Marlboro's, uh, Sylvester Buckland, who's the father of the Marlboro Fire Department, is buried right up here. Mott Stevens, who is a movie actor, uh, TV, television actor, is buried in the cemetery here. So a lot of old graves, graves down there. Yeah, so uh, he was, uh, you can see how well liked Mr. Boyd was. Everybody in the city loved Sam Boyd and what he did for them and everybody. He was very generous as you could see. He did so much for them. It was unbelievable. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, a memorial service was then held on October 9th at the First Church and it was done given by his pastor, a Reverend Burke Levite. And it was, he did a discourse and memorial of Sam Boyd. I'm not gonna read it for you because it's about 30 some odd pages. <laughs> a, lot, a, lot, a lot of what I've told you already was in this discourse. It told about his life, but it dug more into his life, about his home life and what a family man he was, how he loved. His home was open to everybody. He could be doing business with you and it wasn't maybe very good business, but he'd invite you into his home and the minute you came into his home, it was like you were best friends. And he would get, you know, give you whatever he had. And uh, so his, he was a real religious man. Um, he was uh, involved with uh, religious instruction at his church and a lot of other things. And these are all different personal points that he that's brought out at the uh, at this memorial service and this discourse this 30 some odd page discourse that the, his uh, his pastor gave to him which was they had a packed church again and overflowing people out onto the street and everything they couldn't fit everybody in there everybody wanted to be part of it and be there so <clears throat> for over a half a century 56 years to be exact Samuel Boyd stayed at home and did his life work, building up his native place, Marlboro, just as he said he would when he started out in 1836. For this reason, he truly can be characterized as the father of our city. I hope you agree with me after hearing my presentation. I'd like to open it up if anybody has any questions. Hopefully I have the answers. Paul? I got two questions, uh, Bob. Bob. I, I'm just curious. The, uh, the wavy hair, the high forehead, the far away look, the short stature. Is there any chance that you're uh, descended from <laughs> Very good. <laughs> look, the same, same grimace. <laughs> and I've got all his money, but it's over in Switzerland. <laughs> and the second question, uh, the Fairmont uh, Park, could you... Uh, on the map, could you point out where Fairmont Park might have been? Oh, all right, you're going to have to bear with me because I'm going to have to go back to it. Fairmont Park would have been up in here, right up here. They had a big bandstand up here that they would oh, hold the things. The they do fireworks there. Right at the top of it? The top, yep. Yeah, yep. Is it where all those large rocks are? There's some huge rocks. Oh, I don't know. I have, there's, there's, there's houses up here now. See right here? See where his house was? This Onamog Street, which is down here. It was just a paper street for, for years and years. Now it comes down like this. It goes right down next to those condominiums right there. And there's all houses up in here now. That's why we can't have fireworks from Fairmont Hill anymore, because they built houses up there. You know? So that's why we can't have fireworks there. But it was right in this general area, right in here. Was, was Park Street somehow related to it? Was Park, Park Street? Street well, Park Street was, would have been right here. This street here was a different name at the time, at the center, center Street back then. And Park Street came up like that then. Did that lead to the park? No. It came up to Fairmont. Then Fairmont got extended. Fairmont now comes up like this here. Fairmont stopped up. Fairmont basically stopped here. And then they kept uh, bringing it farther and farther and farther up. And now it's even up to here someplace. There's an interesting point that's sticking in my mind here. 
Henry Ford has long been regarded as the founder of you know, assembly line and all the things that you know as mod manufacturing. Yet look at what Mr. Boyd did way before him. Yep. That's kind of revealing about what he was about and what our, our city was influential in in terms of the entire industrial revolution. Yep. It's astounding. Now, how many of you agree with me that he was the father of our city? Raise your hand. Uh, overwhelmingly. Thanks for coming.